whether it be a piece of cowrie or any other species of, of timber. So you want to be sort of thinking about enhancing the bowl. You're not trying to take away the effect of the grain or you're trying to um, uh, uh, hide anything or maybe you might, might want to hide a fault in the grain, but it's a chance to just make it something uh, extra within the design. Uh, whether it be a taller hollow form or a open platter such as that um, piece of remove there so uh, an area of stitching or color uh, which involves texture uh, can be very quick and very accurate uh, and on any particular piece of form whether it be on that piece there and it's hanging down the sides uh, with various different types of materials the materials that we use uh, cheap and available and it's quick to do as you'll see by that one on the end of the bench there So this is not a new idea. It's not my idea uh, It really stemmed from Michael Hosseluk in Canada who's a, a, a Canadian turner for many years who I met in Wellington many years ago <coughs> And he said to me I asked him actually I said to him I said Michael How did you come on this idea? He said well we have really long winters can't get outside, it's too bloody cold, so they spend more time in the workshop. So they start to play with various other ideas outside the norm, and they come up with ideas such as uh, detail and embellishment. There's Michael there in the picture. So when we start our wood turning, we are fully focused on making a piece without breaking it. That's, that's it. When anyone, when anyone starts to go to the lathe, they really want to start to make a bowl so they can justify their $2,000 lathe and their classes that they've been to or the wood they bought. The main focus is really to make a piece without breaking it. Would you agree? Yeah. And, and then as you proceed, you start to get a little bit more challenging with perhaps the shapes and forms, whether it be deeper or bigger or change the wood species <coughs> so when you do that that's when you start challenging yourself in many ways with tool grinding chuck holding drilling um, various different chuck sizes and you start accelerating the forms to be better than perhaps an ashtray type form uh, or what I call a squashed paint tin or a uh, <coughs> one of those round things you put under your bed. So, so really you, you start to get a bit more adventurous and when you do that your whole world starts to open up like pottery or anything else. You start to have a tackle some carving, you tackle some resin inlay, you tackle, tackle some multiple um, inlay using other woods. Um, a couple of very fine examples there look from our club members, from our club members, look at that, look at that YouTube, knock yourself out, <laughs> wanderay! <laughs> so you start tackling something that you've never tackled before, and when you do that, you won't sleep at night, it'll be infectious, you'll want to do another shape, another form, another idea, and that's when you're really starting to justify um, breathing. If you don't rise to that challenge and if you don't move forward with your turning, you'll just be turning more bowls, similar sizes, changing the wood, and you will get bored and you'll sell your lathe or it'll sit in the corner and you will um, just phase out of the idea like potters do, wood turners do it, artists and painters do it. If you're not pushed and if you're not eased into it by someone that can assist and help you and encourage you and mentor you, you're on your bloody own. And it is a lonely place, believe me, after 46 years of it. And if you don't push yourself to try some new designs, you'll be still there and you'll be surrounded by a lot of round stuff that has different woods, different sizes, different weights, but they're all very similar. If you don't move forward in your tool sharpening, your design particularly, your pricing, if you're starting to want to sell your work but you've never sold a piece, then you've got to get over that first hurdle of selling a few pieces. 
And when you do, your whole world opens up. Because I've had people come to me three months after a lesson say, Shane, I've sold 10 of those. I say, good on you, do another 10. Whatever the item is, whether it be a vase or a clock or a bowl or a whatever it is. So it is a individual skill. Uh, clubs like this do a lot of good for all around the world to encourage people to get out of that uh, individual locked up space. And for, the, for those of you that are in that, that area at the moment and you'll feel that, I sympathise. The way to get out of that is to uh, pick people's brains and there's many people in the club here that will share information with you as, as well as me. Uh, to uh, get you out of a, 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 um, a problem. It might be chuck holding, it might be tool sharpening, it might be finished sanding. There's three for a start. And, and there's, there's some, just some clear points about that that you can just pick up on that will just move you forward. Um, one of the best things that you will ever, ever feel is when you fully realize that someone is gonna pay you cash for something you've made off the lathe. And when you get that 50 bucks in your hand, it, it really means something and it will, that will stem you forward. It's not all about selling the work, but even if you're doing it just as a hobby, when you've made something and someone really appreciates it and really wants it and they pay you for it, wow, it just gels. So, and a lot of people are not concerned about selling their work, but when they get up to a certain level and they've got 50 pieces spread around their lounge, <laughs> then they actually think, well, oh, it's actually quite good. I went to a craft market and I sold 15 of those pieces. And that's the target, really. If you're starting to surround yourself with your own work, you need to move stuff, stuff on. Remember some of the first pieces that you turn, you can remount on the lathe. And because you'll still have a chuck holding, you can remount it on the lathe. Uh, and return it. If you feel like you need to get the finish better or you want to put an embellishment in there, you want to turn a crack away or something, you can remount pieces that you've turned two years ago. Like talk to people, go to seminars, go to demos, uh, uh, and look on the net, of course, and you can see many, many different YouTube videos. You just have to be fussy on what you watch and who you follow. I would suggest that you find someone that's particularly skilled and stay with that person. That's my strong advice. If you stumble around and look at 20, 30, 40 different ones and bookmark them, you're surrounded with too much information because there's so many different ways to do this skill. Too many different ways. So then you, you find someone who's particularly skilled and follow that, you get pretty good, pretty damn quick. So these are the four basic skills that I encourage you to watch and be self-critical of in your own work. Um, it's something that took me a long time to actually realise to put together as a teaching aid that will help people uh, do the task because there's a lots of different skills right across the board of, of turning in itself. But to get better at it, what I suggest you do is these are not in any particular order, but this is a target for each and every one of us. Understand the bevel. Now that is purely about the bevel of the tool, which is the grinding angle here. And to understand the bevel and what is that is about on any particular tool that you've got, any gouge, any other tool, whether it be a skew, and understand the bevel. Know how to create it on the grinder, how to hone it, how to look after it. Whatever particular grind that you want, <coughs> understand it. That means seek help of other tuners, try different grinds, be able to grind the tool yourself and get on the net and find out how to do that easily. So it's understand the bevel is one of the four. The next one is sharpen often. Um, nearly everyone I've taught for the last many, many years is absolutely afraid of the grinder. Why is that? Tell me why. Why are they afraid of the bench grinder? Showing the right way. 
They're sharpening it wrong, but they're afraid of ruining the tool. They're afraid of making it worse, right? And you pay 100 bucks for a tool. You don't want to go to the grinder and think, oh, no, I've wrecked the shape of it. So everyone is pushing um, to get better, but they're not sharpening anywhere enough, so therefore you don't get better at sharpening. So the sharpening is often uh, left aside and they're trying to get clean finishes with more dull tools, so therefore they're sanding too much. So sharpen often is very much in there. And I mean, if you're working through a piece, any particular piece, you might have to go to the grinder twice and you're honing stones uh, uh, three times to get the satisfactory finish on the variety of tools that you've got up to standard. The next one of the four here is try new designs. That's what I was tapping into there before. Don't um, continue to just fully lounge up with a whole lot of round shapes. Uh, you will get through that, but you will probably get a bit bored with it. And by going to classes, that will encourage you to do some different shapes, some different, you know, different designs, challenge yourself, whatever it is. Stuff with finials, stuff with lids, stuff with anything. So try it, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it'll encourage you to sharpen your tools more uh, and choose your wood better, uh, and it will just make the variety better. And the, the fourth one there is turn more wood. To get better at anything, it's a repetitive skill. Um, and, and the more you turn, the more you learn. It's just, it's just so obvious. It, you'll be able to sharpen the tools more, you'll, you'll clean finishes better, you'll stand better at the lathe, you'll be more comfortable about the fluid sort of a flow, uh, no matter what species of wood it is. Turn more wood. We've all got wood, but how much good wood have we got? Once you start picking over the pile, you think, oh gee, those pieces have got a lot of cracks in there. And I could have got, you know, cut that a bit differently. So cut the cracks away, choose some good stuff, and rough it out. Spend a decent amount of time and rough out a lot of wood and prepare some shapes that then you can have some fun with some design work on whatever piece it is. And that might involve some cutaway pieces, some carving, some um, uh, any, any choice uh, within the piece, no matter what species of wood it is. We are very lucky in New Zealand of our wood supply. Uh, other demonstrations that I've done overseas, they are really tightened up on a lot of their wood supply and they find it pretty tough, but we're very lucky here. So my suggest to you is don't rough out one or two, rough out 10 and then rough out another 10. Date them, weigh them, and then roll back through them later and start finishing down the track. So you can deal with some dry wood uh, and, and uh, you, you won't have the cracking problems, you'll understand the cuts better, and your finishing cuts on those pieces then will be much, much cleaner because you've done a lot of roughing out and prepared a lot of, a lot of shapes, a lot, ground a lot of tools, and you'll be a lot more relaxed. Most people go to the lathe and they're stiff as a board, absolutely like a flagpole, and that doesn't give you that fluid motion that you want across the tool. It's too rigid and too stiff, and the more you uh, have that fluid motion, the better your forms will be. The quicker they will happen, and the happier you'll be. Stitches and stripes cutting demo I'm going to do, I call them gouge ready projects. It sounds like the government, doesn't it? <laughs> Shovel ready projects. But these are gouged ready because they've been roughed out. I've gathered the timber, I've roughed them out, I've prepped them, I've got a chuck holding. They're now gouged ready and design ready to go back on there and have a play, whether it be a resin inlay or whether it be carving or whether it be a thin wall piece or a square piece. So they are gouged ready to be finished off. The wood gathering and the roughing out is no doubt a, a, a bit of a back-breaking exercise, you've got to have gathering of the wood, you've got to have access to like chainsaws and cutting and muscle power and place to stack the wood. So that all takes a certain amount of time, but the real beautiful part of it is, is the, the turning and the finishing uh, of the various different sizes that you have close at hand. And 
I think too many people would dive into the finishing too early uh, before you've roughed out enough. Uh, the serious ones that come to me at home, the target is 100 bowls roughed out, and that's a minimal amount. 100 bowls roughed out is actually not many. Look how many sitting there, I mean, I don't know, 15, 18, whatever. It's not, 100 bowls is not many of various different sizes. So when you start finishing, you've got dry ones to come back to you, and you are ready for it. You are hungry to get that piece finished. It'll, your tool flow and your sharpening skills and your whole body motion will happen. You know, we all want to justify our lathe and our tools and our bits to turn a marvellous piece and sit it on the mantelpiece. It's just another bowl. So, um, the gouge ready projects that you've roughed out, they're wonderful to, to move into with the design. So what I'm going to show you now on this piece on the lathe here, is some design and texturing and drilling ideas um, that we can do some cross stitch there. Like this type of idea, I'm going to talk to you about drilling and about indexing, use of the index on the lathe, the drilling right through the wall, how we do that. Uh, and you'll see I have a Dremel tied up on a string above the rack on the lathe there. And the materials to do this type of particular task are cheap, they're readily available, they're colourful, and any different size that you want. <coughs> Check it out. If you do a big piece and you put that in there, you're going to sell it to a, a, a boaty or a farmer or a, a logger that's used to using heavy manila rope. That's really available right here in Port Road and it's cheap. It smells and, and feels wonderful. You can use yachting, yachting braid type rope of various different colours. You can inlay that, you can stitch that, you can pull it around to form you can do anything you like with it. If you had a puri bowl and you did a wrap of uh, white around the bowl, it looks absolutely stunning. And the feel of these sort of ropes is nice and slick. They're really smooth and you can pull them tight. <coughs> so the materials are available and it's a quick way to dress up your turning. This doesn't take a lot of time, but it's just a few little jigs that I'm going to show you that will allow you to get to this point pretty quickly. It's still on the chuck, it's on a little mount there. And you can just sit down at your kitchen table and stitch it. Don't stitch it on the lathe or do it in the workshop. Get out onto your deck or sit down at the kitchen table <laughs> and stitch it. Get out of your workshop more. Don't stand there side on and try and stitch it on the lathe. It's, it's just a simple mount like that with a thread on it. It's very, very easy. And, then, and you're looking at the whole thing in a, a sensible sort of a way rather than side on. Um, Stuff with tassels that are hanging down the side there, they can hang down the side there, cross stitch the top a little bit like that. You can through section the thing with a series of holes, I'm going to show you how to drill that. A series of holes where you can stitch it and weave it right through the piece. A lot of the pieces that people buy, they don't buy that to put fruit in it, they buy it because it's a piece of kauri, a piece of history of New Zealand, they like what the design, it feels good and the price is okay, they're going to buy it. They're not necessarily going to buy it for the uh, idea of putting certain things perhaps in there. They like it just because they like it to sh as a showpiece, as a memento of the timber. Uh, and it's sort of treasured that way. Uh, a lot of people, if they want to use a bowl, bowl practically, they'll buy a, a ceramic, a stainless or a glass one. I don't have a wooden fruit bowl. I never have. I'll make them and sell them and, and tell someone how great it is. But my fruit bowl on my in my kitchen on my servery, for those of you that have seen it, is a cane one. Uh, so, you know, a lot of other uh, uh, bowl type of configurations are from other materials. Uh, so you can dress them up uh, and rope edges like I just showed you with that one there. So this is only a very, very small amount of what's possible. Here we go. It's pop light. Arthur's Emporium, uh, anywhere that you can get cheaper materials like that and you can use a great variety of colour thicknesses, you can just buy it per metre. It will encourage you to think about your forms a bit differently and what you can do with that. Excuse me Shane, with, with the, um, the idea of using the rope inlay, yep. this one? Yeah, how do you get on when you come to 
the feet super the joint. Mm. You make a feature of the join. Okay. You bind it with whipping. Oh. And you bind it. That's actually tatting, but I mean you can actually bind it with black whipping or white whipping. So you cut it with a razor knife and bind it. So you just butt it into a trench. So the top of the bowl may have a trench turned in there. Right? We are too um, worried about the join. So the way to get around that is to make a feature of the join that will be recessed into the bowl. Wood and manila rope go together absolutely beautiful. Two natural products together. Bind it, tape it, and bring the other one around and butt it to it. Don't be at all worried about that. If you want to hide it totally, then cut it with a razor knife along the lay of the, uh, the fibre, cut it through there and keep it pinched and then butt them together in the trench and cut the actual uh, rope just a little longer than what's required so that you're cutting it through there with a brand new blade. Even if you think your, your razor knife is sharp enough, it won't be. So a brand new blade cut it through there and you'll find you'll get in a most amazing fit and put it back in there turn the scallop trench glue it in with epoxy put a piece of timber on it and they will butt together but cut it slightly longer so it pushes into position and you won't even see the join because if you've got so many angles within the layer of the rope you just won't see it so i take the the scallop there down in there uh, so the, the rope is set down in there with epoxy and it just is permanent. Yeah, and I'll be doing one of these shortly. Another idea, Shane, too, would be do two more bindings on your rope. So you've got three steps of the flat, it is. Yes. Uh, one yes. for the join and two others. Yes. That's a, yes, there you That would be a simple way so of yeah. So you put binding. three, three, you could put the rope in in three pieces, yeah. or you could just bind those bits there. Well, I was thinking just actually put a binding on it. And yeah, it right normal, it. normal whipping is used to stop rope fraying. Yeah. And it's just tidy and tight. It's the nautical way to do it. Yeah. It looks great. So don't get too worried about the join. Don't let that put you off. If you want to use the ultimate thread, there's some of the uh, whippings that I use here. This is braid uh, in green and black. Um, and you, when you cut it, then you can burn it like with a, with a lighter and you just get a beautiful sealed end, like that end there. It's sealed and won't fray. Um, and you can get it in various weaves, various thicknesses, and it's triple plaited, double plaited. This comes from Nautilus Braids uh, in uh, Christchurch. And they are braid, a company that's just wonderful. wonderful. You can use copper wire as well, can't you? Yeah. You can use copper wire, you can use string, you can use bright colours such as this. Anyone know what this is? This is the cheapest thing everyday packaging binding twine. Four dollars a roll. I mean look at the colour of that. So, so don't um, don't be too worried about about uh, going for the most expensive. You might be on the wrong track. Just choose something that you like the colour of. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. I'll show you an example of that. This piece here. Look at that. When you have a look at that closely, it is a multiple plated tube. 